Good afternoon, Marie News Media TV family. Welcome back to the channel for another news update for April 8, 2024. And in the news this afternoon, good character or not, security guard loses appeal. A security guard who was sentenced seven years ago to a total of eight months imprisonment for shooting and wounding a customer has lost his appeal against his convictions and the sentences. The shooting incident took place at the office of the National Water Commission in Portmore Mall, St. Catherine, in January 2014. Vassal Douglas, the appellant, was convicted on March 24, 2017, of illegal possession of firearm and wounding with intent. He was sentenced on April 6, 2017, to eight months imprisonment at hard labor on each count. The judge ordered that the sentences should run concurrently. Vassal has already served the sentences as he was not on bail pending appeal. The sentences are deemed to have commenced on April 6, 2017 when they were imposed, the Court of Appeal ruled. The general outline of the facts was that the appellant was an armed plainclothes security guard assigned to the NWC. On January 3, 2014, while on duty, an incident occurred between himself and a male customer who had visited the office to complain about damage done to a pipe at his premises by NWC workers. The customer felt that his concerns were not being addressed. As a result, he became upset and began to behave in a boisterous manner. The appellant cautioned the customer and asked him to calm down and lower his voice. The customer refused and was asked to leave the office. Soon after, an altercation ensued between both the men which resulted in the customer being shot in his left arm by the appellant. During the trial, the customer who was the complainant admitted he was talking loudly. He said he did not touch anyone or push anyone in the building during the incident. The complainant was shot in the left arm and was hospitalized for about one week. He testified at the trial in the gun court that when he was shot, he only had his cellular phone in his hand. Vassal said in an unsworn statement at his trial, that on the day of the incident, he approached the complainant several times and told him to calm down. He said on one occasion, the complainant pushed him and slapped him in his face. He said he observed the complainant taking out a ratchet knife and advancing towards him and he fired one shot because he was fearful for his life. Witnesses for the defense said the complainant was behaving boisterously. One witness said she saw the complainant reaching for his waist but they did not see a knife. Several grounds of appeal were argued, one of which was that the judge erred in not upholding the no-case submission. It was also argued that the judge failed to demonstrate that she had shown any regard for the issue of self-defense. Vassal did not appeal against the sentence. Attorney at Law Deborah Martin, who represented Vassal, submitted that the judge's failure to address the appellant's good character denied him of the benefit of having his defense considered against the background as to whether he had the propensity to commit the offenses for which he was tried. The Crown conceded that the appellant was entitled to a good character direction in relation to the propensity limb. However, Senior Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions Sharon Millwood Moore, now acting Poussin judge, and the Crown Counsel Christina Porter argued that considering all the circumstances, it was inevitable that the appellant would have been convicted of the offenses and consequently there was no substantial miscarriage of justice. By a majority decision, Justice Frank Williams and the Justice Georgiana Fraser, in dismissing the appeal on February 23, said what was clearly illustrated by the authorities was that the absence of good character direction is not necessarily fatal to a conviction even where such a direction is warranted. The court said it found no basis for interfering with the trial judge's finding of guilt. Justice Nicole Foster Pusey descended. TPD enhances safety in Treasure Beach. Tourism Product Development Company Limited is moving to improve safety at the Treasure Beach of St. Elizabeth, which has seen tragic incidents of drowning over the years, largely attributed to strong currents and insufficient swimming skills. The south coast town is renowned for its symbolic bays, coves and beaches and has long been a favored destination for locals and tourists alike. TPD Co. in a release over the weekend 
said it has undertaken proactive measures to enhance the safety along the coastline by installing caution and the no swimming signs. The initiative spearheaded by TPDCO, with the technical support from the National Environment and the Planning Agency, has been approved by the St. Elizabeth Municipal Corporation. Consultative input from stakeholders, including the Birds of Foundation, local community members, as well as the Member of Parliament for Southwest St. Elizabeth, Floyd Green, guided the strategic placement and design of the signs. Eleven caution signs and the seven no swimming signs have been erected. According to the Director of Product Quality and Community Tourism at the TPD Call, Lionel Murray, the signs were strategically placed across 10 locations, namely Great Bay, Pointy Hill, Tranquility Bay, Old Dwarf Beach, Calabash Bay Eastern, Calabash Bay Western, Frenchman Bay, Johns Rock Point, Billy's Bay, and Fort Charles Beach. Mary, in highlighting the collaborative nature of the project, said we were guided by the citizens of the community as to where to put the signs. This approach underscored the TPDCO's commitment to prioritizing the safety and the well-being of both the residents and the visitors. Commenting on the significance of the project, MP Green said, This is part of our Destination Assurance Drive, and I believe that Treasure Beach has the best community tourism product in the region. Green also stressed the importance of ensuring visitor safety and highlighted the need to educate individuals about the potential risk associated with swimming in certain areas of Treasure Beach. He also outlined the plans for further safety measures, including the training and the certification of local residents as lifeguards during high traffic seasons and emphasized the importance of community involvement in safeguarding the well-being of all beachgoers. Green also expressed the optimism about the positive impact of the measures on visitor safety and overall tourism experiences, noting that while not all waters in Treasure Beach are off-limits, it is crucial to provide clear information to ensure the safety of all beachgoers. According to TPDCO, the installation of caution and the no-swimming signs represent another measure within a comprehensive strategy to enhance the safety and to promote responsible tourism practices in Treasure Beach. Parallel Diaspora Conference to Put Spotlight on Government Corruption and Crime A Parallel Diaspora Conference has been announced by organizers for June 16-19, to 19, coinciding with the 10th Biennial Jamaica Diaspora Conference to be held at the Montego Bay Conference Center in Montego Bay, St. James. Billed as the first Biennial Diaspora Conference, the organizers Dr. Rupert Francis, head of the Diaspora Crime Intervention, and the Prevention Task Force, and Wilfred Rattigan said the conference would be held from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. each day. They said that this diaspora conference will be held on social media platforms. During a launch of the conference on April 5, the organizers listed the theme of their conference as a promise and a peace. According to Francis, the Jamaica Diaspora Conference in Montego Bay is being organized by the government of Jamaica and not to the people in the diaspora. He further stated that issues of importance to the diaspora are not being addressed by the Jamaica Diaspora Conference. Francis listed among the issues to be discussed at his group's diaspora conference as a government corruption, crime and security, health care and government engagement with members of the diaspora, among others. While Francis claimed that none of these issues are scheduled to be discussed at the Jamaica Diaspora Conference, it was suggested by speakers taking part during the April 4 launch in Kingston that crime and the security, health care and investment in Jamaica by Jamaicans in the diaspora will be among the agenda areas which have not yet been officially released. The Jamaica Diaspora Conference hopes to attract some 1,000 people to Jamaica for the conference, along with a worldwide audience which will be able to participate on social media platforms. The conference will also have a marketplace where Jamaican-owned businesses in the diaspora will be able to advertise as well as make connections with similar Jamaican businesses to increase their sales and their visibility. The idea of the parallel conference has drawn mixed reactions from some members of the Jamaican diaspora. Some people who spoke with the news questioned the motives of the organizers, while others felt that the Jamaica diaspora conference should be organized by members of the diaspora and not the government. 
Peter Gracie, Global Diaspora Council member for the Southern U.S. region, said he was aware of the parallel conference and suggested that there needed to be a sit-down to rectify what is going on. No one owns the diaspora, so anyone can announce and hold a diaspora conference, but the use of the logo by the group hosting this conference is a source for confusion, he said. Gracie said he has received several calls from members of the diaspora expressing confusion about the conferences. He said that people should not follow the noise, but to pay attention to the information coming from the Global Diaspora Council and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Foreign Trade. Everyone means well for Jamaica, but the confusion is not helpful, he said. Dr. Alan Cunningham, former Global Diaspora Council board member for the southern U.S. region, said the organizers were well within their rights to organize such a conference, but he would have hoped that they would have chosen different dates for the conference being held in Jamaica. Everyone is entitled to do what he or she wants to do, and I suspect that the conference here will not include the agenda of the conference in Jamaica, he said. Cunningham said that he is not expecting anything negative to come out of the conference being organized here.